So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining today or whenever you're watching the recording video. Welcome to the Asia Health Policy Program Colloquium Series on Health, Medicine and Longevity, Exploring Public and Private Roles. From the conceptual foundations to the daily realities of practitioners, this colloquium series explores the evidence and experience of the public-private nexus in health sectors across Asia in comparative global perspective. Please join us in three weeks at the same time, February 10th, for a keynote from Nobel laureate Oliver Hart on a quarter century of the proper scope of government, theory and application. Since we cannot hold a conference in person, bringing together colleagues from Asia and around the world and beyond, I produced a video tribute. We will share some highlights first, and then I will introduce our three panelists today to relate that framework to on the ground realities of public private collaboration in the health sector in Asia. So please enjoy the highlights of the video tribute. It's a great paper, and it's a it's a paper that took takes up uh, one of the central questions in economics about the where where should the boundary fall between the government and the private sector, and uh, focusing on the provision of services. Who who take a service that the public is going to pay for, and who should who how should that be provided? Should it be government employees, a government agency that provides it, or should it be uh, through a contract with the, with the private sector. And what is, I think, what, what is powerful about the paper is it provided a structured way to think about that problem using the incomplete contracting ideas that, that Oliver and others had uh, developed uh, over the prior decade, decade and a half. And um, it's a very simple framework where the where you see that that private providers have stronger incentives than the public se sector uh, and but those incentives are not always for the good because they have an incentive to provide more quality of service and to reduce costs but sometimes it can be too much uh, incentive and so they they focus too much on sort of cutting costs and efficiency and, and so forth and uh, and that skews away from just providing uh, a quality service at a at a cost that the, the public would support and I think what's, you know, one of the great strengths of the paper is just the way the, the way the model is set up and the way the thinking is set up, it has incredibly general applicability. So the number of services where you can think about this question being pertinent, it's is vast. It's the provision of health care. Who should provide health care is the provision of the, the military services. You use private military contractors or the or the military, roads and infrastructure, transportation, education. The application of the papers to prisons, but the scope of the paper goes way beyond that, and so it's a really powerful framework, and it has uh, informed, you know, two and a half decades of, of literature since then. Um, yeah, and, and again, thank you, Karen, for inviting us. Uh, um, I echo everything that John said. Um, I would add to that that you know it, it's interesting. This paper was published just about a decade after the uh, Grossman Hart paper. Um, which, uh, you know, was was very, very much a literature changing paper. I'm a huge fan of this paper. And, and so I think the paper just has this enormous influence in, in these settings where you have non-contractable quality. And in many cases where I think the production function is also a bit unclear. I also saw some of this issue with non-contractable quality in my work in development, um, surprisingly. And that's something that I love so much about the paper. It's applicable in so many different settings. Of course, this is a uh, classic article or we wouldn't be talking about it. And uh, I think its uh, strengths are that it has a uh, very easily understood model um, that yield some non-obvious conclusions uh, on a, an issue that certainly uh, has been uh, a long-standing important issue and to some degree remains unresolved to today. I think the, the, the key contribution of the paper is already in the title. 
scope of government. So I, I love the paper. I think it's really, really good. And, 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 and um, I've found it inspiring in my own work. When should the government provide a service in-house versus uh, go to the private sector? Uh, you know, it really had, I, I think, a big impact because it sort of highlighted how challenging this pro problem can be for a lot of services. Um, because when you contract with the private sector, one thing that's good is they have very good um, incentives, financial incentives, potentially, to be efficient. Um, but you also run this risk of um, maybe their financial incentive being so strong that they cut corners, and especially on what the authors refer to as non-contractable quality. I should say uh, there is also one option in my class for students. They, they have to do a, a term paper. And uh, I've been teaching this class for the last uh, 10 years or so. And I must say that if I had to uh, count how many times, what is the best seller? What is the, the paper which has been the most uh, taken in the reading list to, uh, to make uh, an overview and a term paper? This is definitely uh, this Art Schleifer Vishni paper. It has been the most successful uh, paper uh, for my student. Uh, I think uh, any student, uh, be it in uh, organizational economics, which is an area where this is heavily applied, uh, political economy, where this has uh, got some traction, um, different parts of industrial organization, uh, should be familiar with the way these models work because they are powerful ways in which to view problems. Because if you think of, uh, of that, case now where for example in Rome there was recently a referendum where the population was asking for uh, uh, moving from for from an in-house provision to uh, contracting out competitive tendering through competitive tendering because the, the in-house provider was was failing to perform and and uh, what is interesting uh, was that if you think, for example, of that sector in terms of harsh life and ambition, you know, what is that you can think of? You, recently, uh, uh, technologies has a reason, GPS technology, which allows you to perfectly verify where a bus is in uh, in uh, which. Um, in which uh, uh, stop, so you can uh, uh, measure waiting time at bus stops. You can uh, verify that the average um, speed of uh, drivers. So you have a technology that, if used properly, gives you the possibility to really verify quality. And in London, for example, they have contracts where they deduct uh, payments to the private contractor if. Uh, waiting times are excessive or speed is excessive and so on and so forth. So in those situations, you can verify quality. So quality is not an issue. Therefore, you, you have the decision must be driven more by cost consideration. Hars and colleagues uh, proposed so like garbage collection or in Finland, snow clearing services. <laughs> so, so that's something for sure that, that you can easily use this framework for, for deciding what uh, tasks are good to keep in-house and what can be privatized or outsourced. But what we did is, was about this uh, contracting out the last mile, we call it. This is a study that we done a couple of years ago, published in the GPE in 2019. You know, the Rise from the Poor program has been in place for about a decade. That was about 1.5 billion US dollars every year, targeted to about 15.5 million households in Indonesia. Before this article, we had thought of the main difference as being one of efficiency due to um, the fact that uh, shareholders would benefit from cost reductions, you know, with price being constant, 
uh, but where you don't have shareholders and you have some residual claimant who is not spe specified, we don't really maybe even know who that is, uh, that they, these hospitals would not be as efficient. But we really had not much to say about quality. We do find evidence that the government, that the VA hospitals save lives. So in, in that kind of really um, simple metric of quality, um, the VA hospitals reduce mortality by about a half, which is a striking finding. Um, so we find that there is no trade-off here in terms of quality or cost. In fact, the VA saves lives at lower cost. I believe that the paper by Hart and colleagues is actually the best paper about the purchase of provider split. It really explains it in a very nice, nice way. In India, uh, uh, we see the first large national public health insurance scheme in 2008. It covered nearly a quarter of that country uh, uh, or maybe a third of the country's population. So it's arguably the largest healthcare program. And a critical issue that it faced was, should the government provide insurance directly or should the government purchase insurance for the population, for the poor population from private insurers? And the first iteration of that policy, and that policy is Rasya Swastabiva Yojana, um, actually chose the latter, chose private contracting. And in the process of doing that private contracting, the government learned about the sort of shirking that you would see in quality and the lower costs that you would see, and then decided later on when it shifted to a new policy. So this is the PMJ uh, or Ayushman Bharat program that was implemented about two years ago, that the shirking on quality in favor of reducing costs was so large that it should allow the government to provide insurance. And so the new version of the policy, uh, again, is a shift towards government provision because of quality issues uh, and excessive cost cutting. COVID is like a perfect example of something that you can't possibly write a complete contract. Uh, so the context is going to be India uh, and some other countries that I've been doing some advising in, like uh, Indonesia and the Philippines. When the pandemic hit, uh, there were a number of actions that you would have thought the government would make. For example, how you should treat patients or how you should test uh, patients. And now more recently, vaccination. And each of these decisions, the question wasn't whether or not the government should do something. The question is whether or not the government should do it directly or the government should contract it out. So let me give you the example of hospital care. Um, we wanted to set up medical facilities to treat COVID patients. Should that be done by government hospitals or should we pay private hospitals to engage in this care? The government thought about it and there was a debate and the government chose to do it at government hospitals um, in part because they didn't trust the private hospitals. So I think is a feature of the of the of the Indian political system or Indian political culture. A second situation where that occurred was testing. Testing was done primarily by the government and regulated by the government and tracked by the government. And the government did not spend a lot of effort getting out private testing and certifying more private labs, even though there's way more private capacity than there's government capacity. One could argue that that's the reason why the government was so slow to get testing uh, up and running in India. Uh, when it finally allowed private contracting, you actually saw a big change. A third area is vaccine allocation. So I think it provides us with a, a fairly nuanced framework um, to, that we can take across different settings and sort of understand that there's not gonna ever be you know, one right answer to this question. Um, but an answer that is the right fit for a right setting in a given, you know, in a particular part, point in time. Uh, and, and I think that where Oliver went was a very interesting expansion of the incomplete contracts literature. I, I've always been a, a fan of uh, Oliver and, uh, and uh, uh, I think. As a researcher, and also I think uh, he's also uh, uh, a, a great person. I'd ask him something like, you know, if you were if you were starting your career now as an economic theorist again, well, I guess I might ask him, would you start your career now as an economic theorist, or would you do something else in economics? But 
you know, what, what would he, what would he, what would he choose to work on today if he was just at the beginning of, of his career and he was um, uh, starting out again? So there are more examples and the full video will be available on the website if anyone's interested and join us in three weeks to hear from Oliver Hart or ask questions. Now we're gonna talk about the specific context in um, Asia, focusing on NGOs in the private sector. And our first speaker is Dr. Dale Huntington. He was currently Senior Director of Healthcare Systems for Emerging Markets with Johnson & Johnson based in Singapore where he serves as the primary global health policy lead in Asia and the Pacific. And before that, he was uh, with the WHO, working as the director of the Asia Pacific Observatory on Health Policy and Systems. Dr. Huntington, welcome. Thank you, Karen. And welcome to the seminar for everyone listening in. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about some innovative financing models uh, as a mechanism for financing um, contracting out or contracting in of different services by government. Next slide. I'm based in Singapore and the context that I work in is within the Asian region. Uh, and definitely within Asia, we see this very much as Asia being the global healthcare's new center of gravity in the 21st century. And as we enter the 22nd decade of this century. Next slide. Um, you can double click here. Thank you. Um, Asia is becoming the world's largest healthcare market, and this is driven by a number of forces, including economic growth, demographic and epidemiological transitions, and is guided by national UHC policies, which are common across all of the countries in the region. Um, there's a lot of factoids in the slide, but I'll draw your attention to two on the right-hand slide, 12% of the Asian healthcare market growth versus 5% global, and 60% of the global healthcare growth is driven by Asian demand. Next slide. Within this context in Asia, supply side shortages are ubiquitous and governments are known to largely underspend in the health sector across particularly the Southeast Asia region. Um, some notable exceptions, of course, not all governments are underspending, but in general, one can say that governments are not quite spending enough in the healthcare sector. Next slide. Nevertheless, total health expenditures are growing despite weak government expenditures. And this is large part obviously driven by private payments. In this slide, you can see some of the annual healthcare expenditure pool growth over the past decade, 2010 to 20. And you have a, about an 18% growth, uh, largely driven by hospitals uh, and other providers on the far left-hand side, about 40% of that growth is growing ahead. But my point in this slide is, and we'll transition into the next part of the presentation, is that private investors are paying attention to this growth in healthcare expenditure and growth in the healthcare market in Asia. Next slide. Now tracking foreign direct investment specific to a sector and even within a sector, how it's allocated is very tricky. The data is not usually publicly available. It's hard to really understand exactly how the money's flowing in on a regional or a global level into any particular country. But we do know from anecdotal reports, as you can see in this press briefing, that yes, there's a large uptrend in private capital investments occurring in countries across the region, Philippines, Indonesia, China, India, uh, and all the other countries. We're starting to see major investments, both from equity, uh, capital equity firms, as well as venture funds. Next slide. So here's the problem and here's the issue. How can governments shape and steer these private investments towards public priorities? Emerging market governments are turning towards innovative financing mechanisms as a means to replace overseas development of assistance to supplement tax-based revenues, including mandatory health insurance premiums. This table on the bottom is from a somewhat dated WHO publication of several years ago that kind of mapped out different types of innovative financing mechanisms that are at play. If you could click, please. I'm going to focus the next part in looking at how bonds are used and how blended capital are used. And this will bring us back to this theme of the symposium of contracting out of services. How is government paying for these contracts as they move forward? Next slide. A strategic entry point to understanding how these bonds and blended financing is moving is to think about the rapidly changing healthcare financing dynamics and a term of social impact investing has come into terminology to, to 
categorize what is a large part of an investment portfolio that's occurring in the private sector. And we're seeing in the second decade of the 21st century, a blurring of lines between philanthropy, venture funding, and equity investors. In part, this is driven by a growth in wealthy individuals and family foundations. Uh, these people and these foundations are looking for both social and financial returns on their investments. And at the same time, you have commercial venture funds and equity investors are in large part drawing in philanthropic money into their portfolio. The wealth management side of commercial banks are investing in venture funds that look for social impact investing. There's a group called Asian Venture Philanthropy Network, AVNP. Um, you may Google that. This is a group that's really working in this area aggressively, and they have a number of really good publications that map out what's occurring in this space. And again, it's rapidly changing, and I find it quite innovative. Next slide. So within this space, we call blended financing kind of an under umbrella term. And this is crowding in different types of capital to leverage greater impact. If you look on the slide, you say traditional philanthropy, but that could be a traditional uh, bilateral or multilateral institution of giving a grant or technical assistance to an implementer uh, with development outcomes. Could even be performance-based or outcome-based. Um, but what we're seeing with blended finance is that multiple groups will come together, both the donor and partners and in, in the other partners, such as the equity firms or the private capital, to put the money together into a blended instrument where it is implemented and then outcomes are achieved. Blended finance is the strategic use of development finance and philanthropic funds to mobilize private capital flows in support of SDG related investments, in development countries. And that's kind of the classic working definition of blended finance as we think through this innovative financing space. Next slide. Blended finance is attractive because it's a mean to draw in private finance for public sector goals. Government sees this as an opportunity of mitigating risk for public sector investments in programs that have uncertain effectiveness or with underdeveloped outcomes of success. It's also a way for government to mobilize resources from the private sector to support national health goals and programs adhering to the Paris Declaration of Aid Effectiveness Principles, such as alignment and harmonization from 2004 onwards. So governments see this as an attractive way of kind of steering private money by putting it in with their own funding in a blended way. And it also helps governments manage these transitions in emerging markets, middle income countries, as they're shifting away from a reliance on overseas development assistance to maximizing the use of domestic resources. So the private equity and blended finance can fill this gap neatly for governments in a transition period. Next slide. Now what's really drawn our attention is working in this area of social impact bonds. And this is a, a unique type of blended investment that's really gaining attention in the health sector recently. It started out in other sectors, mainly in education and the social scene, but also in some of the other um, more capital intensive sectors like roads or energy. Um, and this is a, a impact bond has an outcome pair, an upfront pair funder, a service provider, and an evaluator. And this slide kind of lays out the five core elements of how an impact bond will work. An outcome pair, in a sense, it could be the government, uh, specifies success outcomes and the amount of money that they will pay for those outcomes. Upfront funders will provide the upfront financing to the service provider to execute the program. So they fund the service provider directly, service provider delivers the services to the population, and there's an independent external evaluator who measures and audits the program and, and validates, yes, these service providers have achieved the outcomes that the outcome payer specified at the beginning of the project. So at that point, the outcome payer will reimburse the investor, the upfront funders their original capital plus a modest agreed upon uh, interest payment that could range in low single digits to mid single digits. Sometimes it can go up into a, a low double digits, but generally it's around six to 8% or four to 6% interest will be paid by the outcome payer to the investor to offset their risk in managing the program. Now the downside is of course, if the service provider doesn't achieve those goals, 
then the payment is now given to that investor, either fully or partially met. Um, so that's how these impact bonds work on a high level point of view. Um, as I mentioned, these are relatively new in the health sector and particularly in Asia, they're just starting to come in within the last few years. Next slide. We had the opportunity in New Zealand to work with the New Zealand government. Johnson & Johnson was a class A investor in a bond that worked to improve mental health performance. It looked to improve mental health outcomes by delivering uh, a reduced welfare dependence. Um, they worked well, I won't go through the whole slide for want of time, uh, but in general, this bond met all of its objectives early on. The New Zealand government was satisfied with it and reimbursed J&J plus 4% for our commercial investment in standing up this activity in 2018. Next slide. Now the devil's in the detail and I put this slide up to show that yes, the, the high level view of those five steps is very clear and precise, but as you get into these bond structures, it does get quite complex. You have the governmental agency, you have the investors, the money is, the government gives it to an intermediary that distributes it to the service providers. There may be multiple providers. There's an advisory group that oversees it to make sure that the group is doing the right thing according to what government wants, as well as what the investor wants. Uh, the outcomes are achieved. There's a repayment given to the uh, investor eventually. Um, but as you can see, there's many financial flows in these models. Each one of those financial flows have to be governed by a legal uh, and, and compliance uh, protocol. So there's lots of oversights and these bonds take some time to develop uh, and put into place. Underpinning it, of course, is a question of trust. And that's the fundamental aspect that we see most exciting about this is building trust between the government and the private sector. There's a trust from the private sector that yes, they're going to be reimbursed if they achieve these objectives. And there's a trust from the government that the private sector is going to be working in areas that government supports and will be doing the right thing according to what government policy and programs want to achieve. Next stage. So as I mentioned, the government in New Zealand were very satisfied. They adopted the bond afterwards as business as usual. And J&J, &J, we took that experience and have been forming the development of other social impact bonds that we're currently working on in India and Singapore. Next slide. So just in conclusion, a few points. The healthcare financing landscape is changing dramatically in Asian emerging markets. Commercial and private funding is growing as an important source of revenue. Both supply and demand side financing is occurring. Demand side financing, private health insurance. It's topic of another presentation. Um, concurrently with the changes in the landscape of financing, there's profound transitions occurring in philanthropic giving. And philanthropic giving is not trivial. It can be quite substantial in a lot of markets. And the COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating public-private partnership mechanisms for resource mobilization. Um, and so we're in an era now that government is turning to work with private sector in new and unheard of ways previously to the pandemic. And this is something that we think we can leverage moving forward to further establish this trust between the private sector and public. Next. But governments are playing catch up in many ways to understand how to engage private sector investors. And traditional technical advisors, such as the United Nations, the lending banks, bilateral agencies, they're largely been focused on public finance system reforms and have not been developing the experience of working with private investors, the equity funds, the venture funds, even the philanthropic world. So there's a need for policy forums for government, ODA agencies, and the private sector to come together. And these forums in diverse ways, whatever way they take, are critically important to shape conducive arrest arrangements for investments, to map out value propositions for both government and private, and to establish those trusted relations across sectors. Next slide. And that's it. Thank you. Look forward to the questions. Over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Dale. Yes, and all of our participants, if you would like to put any questions in the Q&A, we will next go from financing to uh, service delivery and non-government organizations in Asia, joined by two very experienced colleagues. Because of the time difference, they're not both joining us live, but Dr. Karki is. 
So I will introduce both of them and then we'll hear with their pre-recorded um, contributions and then we'll have questions at the end. So first we have Mr. Satcha Munchok, who is the Executive Director of the Khmer HIV AIDS NGO Alliance, Kana in the Kingdom of Cambodia, which he'll describe more in his presentation. He has professional background in social science, has been devoted to public health work for 27 years in government, the UN and NGOs in more than two decades with Kana and in many other roles. And second, we'll have Dr. Jivan Karki, who's also joining us live. He's a development professional with a PhD in public health, a master's degree in rural development and bachelor's degrees in civil engineering and business administration has over 20 years of experience in leading development organization and managing projects in Nepal. It's currently working with the University of Sheffield and leads Phase Nepal, an NGO he founded in 2006, which he'll be um, sharing experiences with us about and works with multiple partners at the grassroots level. So please enjoy their contributions. I would try to uh, start by doing my side introduction. My name is uh, Sokimran Chuok. Um, I'm currently the executive director of one of the local NGO called my HIV AIDS NGO Alliance Kana. Um, uh, we, um, we established uh, uh, in 1996. Uh, so far, it's almost uh, two decades now. Uh, this organization exists in Cambodia and we start our organization first uh, during the um, pandemic of HIV AIDS uh, during a decade of 19. So we start from that time. So we come at the same time of the high peak of the epidemic. Uh, we start with prevention program in general, and then we move to providing care and support um, to those who are dying because of HIV and AIDS. And then uh, we continue uh, to support the country to, in, uh, uh, to uh, provide the uh, focal prevention uh, services uh, for those who are key and uh, vulnerable to HIV and AIDS. The organization also evolving uh, from time to time because uh, we have many demanding from community. So we expand our HIV AIDS program to a broader health response. This including providing co-infection services, uh, especially uh, tuberculosis, and uh, also uh, doing some kind of uh, uh, TB case detection in the community. So we join uh, the national program in doing TB case detection, uh, providing uh, TB care services, but also uh, support uh, community um, to have the avoid, especially um, both HIV and TB affected community to have the avoid in policy discussion, in program planning, as well as to uh, have them engage so then they feel more empowered and they feel more um, uh, ownership and take some role and leadership in the response uh, to ensure um, we will have a resilient and sustainable uh, health system where uh, community need uh, responsive in somehow, you know, um, integrated, well integrated into the policy. In the current COVID-19 pandemic moment, um, there's a lot of concern that many of the other scourges of health that the world are dealing with are not being addressed in an, mm. as with as much urgency. And mm. so maybe you could speak with us a little bit about how um, the current pandemic is or is not impacting your day-to-day -day work in the field? Um, actually, um, I think this is a really important question. Um, uh, the Cambodia actually is not um, one of the hit hard, uh, hard hit of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, actually. Um, the the uh, hard hit as time was in March, actually, uh, in 2020. And from March uh, to June uh, 2020, um, some of the uh, service delivery, um, we, we still continue to do, uh, to offer service delivery, but we have to re-strategize the approach and have to adjust our intervention to meet the need, but also to ensure that uh, the community will not uh, having a duplication of um, a vulnerability of 
uh, COVID-19 as well. So the way that we do, for example, um, normally um, if there is no COVID-19 pandemic, um, we run a community session um, where we collaborate with health facility, where we bring our gen expert machine, where we bring our X-ray machine uh, close to community, and we offer testing and diagnosis on the community uh, at the community level. But because of COVID-19, we cannot do that. We cannot uh, um, uh, doing a ground uh, gathering. So the way that we do, um, we arrange the appointment. Uh, we, we set up our appointment schedule. So um, we still keep our team. We have our mobile and our team of uh, gen expert and uh, x-ray machine uh, at community. But um, we invite uh, people based on the schedule and we set, set a different schedule for people to come. So this is a way how we do, how we offer uh, testing and diagnosis for people. In the meantime, we also um, continue to offer a uh, service uh, in a way of one-to-one -one, uh, uh, contact, uh, support by uh, um, the online, online counseling, online of uh, service delivery, for example, um, uh, we uh, keep communicating with people uh, through social media um, so then they can uh, come and get uh, access to testing for HIV and TB. But also um, we, um, we support them to do what we call like um, uh, e-supply, e-supply of uh, medicine uh, by working closely with the national program to make sure that um, the supply of the medicine can last for a, a longer term. So the people living with HIV do not need to come to the clinic and get the supply every month. But uh, if there is any problem, they uh, can uh, 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 contact the uh, clinic um, uh, doctor, clinic physician, if, uh, and report uh, what the problem, and then they contact through a phone communication rather than to have a face-to-face -face communication. The same for TB. Uh, TB, uh, uh, people affected by TB or pe uh, people who test uh, TB, uh, they can get supply, you know, um, one, uh, one for every month. So they don't need to come every week, but they can take uh, one month supply. So, so this is how we create a space where we facilitate um, the supply to make sure that there is no service interruption, even though within the uh, pandemic of uh, COVID-19. Thank you for sharing that. As you know, one of the themes that we're looking at in this series is the special place of NGOs like yours in serving the vulnerable in the health sector and how, as you've illustrated, they help to build resilience and community empowerment. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how in the face of incomplete contracts and unexpected events like the current pandemic and its regional and global repercussions, how you um, define priorities and um, measure impact. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, through, based on my experience over the past, uh, almost 30 years now I've been in public health, I see that, you know, um, with uh, the partnership approach, collaborative approach is the best way to measure the impact. Uh, especially uh, try to put those who they themselves own the problem to be part of the response. Um, and this is how we can build a strong system. Um, because, you know, uh, if we just look at a supply side without thinking demand side, uh, it will never work. So we have to make sure that uh, how we can uh, uh, weigh and balance uh, the way the approach uh, is doing. Um, the collaboration with civil society, the collaboration with uh, people affected by the disease is the best way uh, to support the health system, meeting the expectation, but also uh, maintain, like you just say, you know, this is how uh, we uh, can uh, ensure that how we can uh, 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 create a platform, create a connection where the system is more resilient, the system is more sustainable because if there is no strong engagement, no strong uh, support and partnership building from the stakeholder, especially civil society and affected community um, and private sector in particular, I think this, this is hard. And the experience tells us many things. And this is 
the expert in Cambodia in particular around the response to HIV AIDS. Cambodia is, I think, not, uh, it is one of not many countries who have a good lesson learned in control uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, I think we one of the seven countries in the world that uh, we um, have achieved uh, tremendous um, uh, target, especially you know uh, putting uh, the people on treatment, um, supporting people to know their HIV status, and support people to have a viral load suppressed. So um, uh, Cambodia uh, can come to this stage is because from the beginning, um, you know everyone engaged from our king to our prime minister to our legislator to our religious community, to our academy, uh, to our affected community, and to everyone, local authority. So we respond to HIV through a way that we call multi-sectoral response. So this, uh, through multi-sectoral response, uh, we have one uh, uh, national coordination body where they can work alongside with all stakeholders, including affected community and civil society. And then we have very, uh, only one a national strategic plan coordinating and the plan uh, supporting the response. And we have one MNE framework uh, to measure the outcome and the impact of the response. So this is how the country uh, so proud that we can, can control HIV AIDS. And similar for COVID-19. So if you were speaking to uh, a government official in another country that's skeptical about NGOs, what would you say? Um, I think um, we right now continue to work alongside with the government, especially through the facilitation of uh, one of the national coordination body for a response called National Aid Authority to, to make sure there is a framework uh, which we call a social contracting, social contracting uh, framework or mechanism where the national budget, where uh, domestic resource uh, uh, can uh, be set aside uh, to support uh, civil society or NGO uh, to do a certain uh, uh, task of work of the government. So right now, uh, this kind of uh, uh, mechanism or the uh, documented or the um, written in the national strategic plan of the National Aid Authority, where they put very strongly social contracting mechanism uh, to ensure that um, uh, civil society and affected community uh, will be fine uh, so that they can uh, do in their, their, their role in a certain uh, uh, work, in, you know, something like that. So if I would say, you know, this is a kind of how the government motivate the, uh, and this is the way that the government continue to empower a stakeholder. And I think not just um, uh, community affected by the disease, but civil society, private sector. I think, like I said, you know, this, the, the learning from uh, HIV response in Cambodia, we do need everyone. We do need everyone. And if we want to see change, HIV aid program can be a model for, for many things, for many health response, for many uh, development programs. We need, we need to create a partnership. We need to maintain partnership. We need to ensure that partnership is probably fine uh, so then uh, uh, you know uh, we, we, we can deliver a certain job. Thank you very much, Professor Karen, for giving me this opportunity to present my experience of working in Nepal uh, in NGO sector. Uh, I'll be talking my experience about how how we do partner with the government and other sector and what how we'll be how we are benefiting and what are the challenges mostly I'll be talking in that line and in case of Nepal now this year there are almost like 52,000 NGOs registered in Nepal they were there were only about 500 NGOs in 1990 and then it is almost like 50,000, so that 100, 100 times increase uh, in NGOs. Now, and there are about 200 to 250 international NGOs as well, and about 1,000 of the NGOs work in the health sector. 
and that is because and the government investment is very low in Nepal. Uh, for example, one six percent of GDP in health, nearly seventy percent of the uh, other the health sector is covered by by other sectors, other other means, uh, mainly PP, private sectors and NGO and philanthropic sector, and eighty percent of that is from out of the pocket expenses. So that is why it makes sense to go the involvement of NGO sector in in health, and in Nepal. NGO sector's main involvement is mainly in the marginalized population uh, where government can't prioritize or government can't go all the time. Let me put that way. So it is mainly women, children, and mar marginalized population. And NGO sector played a very um, vital role in emergencies as well, especially in, uh, during the 2015 earthquake. And they, they also, played a role in introduction of the health insurance in Nepal. So, and there are challenges as well uh, in the private and government sector. That, that is where the uh, NGOs come to fill the gap. So I'll talk about how the organization Phase Nepal I'm involved uh, is contributing or involved in, the, in this sector. This organization was set up in 2006 by some colleagues, including me, to work in health education and livelihood sector in Nepal, uh, especially to work in remote area where other organizations rarely go. Currently, we have around 190 staff, and most of them are female. And our current chair and 40% of uh, our uh, members are female. I just want to highlight that bit. So how we operate? We work with the government health and education system. We don't uh, work in our own or we don't work in parallel with the government. We work with the government system, but we try to bring in those left out people, marginalized and those who are not getting the service or the health service or education opportunities to the mainstream. We partner with the local NGOs and uh, local community-based organizations and we work with the elected government body and we have a very bottom-up planning approach. For example, our graduate level staff, they discuss with the people in the community and then we, we built up the project and then we discuss with the local, our local level staff and design the project, then we try to seek the funding and, and, and run these activities. We, we try to address the uh, issues and feedback the people provide at the local level and then at the management level. And, and we always, always advocate for free healthcare at the point of service. And we try to advocate is community-based primary healthcare, especially in the very remote areas. Uh, there are some hospitals and other things at the cities, but people who live many days walk away from those centers can't reach. So we advocate in these two points. And we have a three, 360 degree feedback mechanism. What we do is we have, in, we have trained and we train some of the community people to operate basic mechanism of the uh, video cameras and that sort. And we ask them to, uh, to feedback their view about the project and what they want that sort on the video. And we, we try to screen those videos to the policymakers. So, and to our management, and we are very, very transparent as well. If you look at the center of this diagram, there is a circle uh, for poor health. It leads to fewer livelihoods, opportunities, and lower chance of education. And then lower, of ch lower chance of education leads to poor health. Then this circle continues. So Faith Nepal believes in breaking this cycle by introducing a good healthcare service in the community. So once we introduce a quality healthcare, health education and sanitation um, opportunities, then that population, healthcare population who trust in face services, and, they, and we provide them the adult literacy that comes into the education, alternative classes. That means, uh, alternative classes means uh, 
a catch-up class for the children who left uh, school for some reason, we, we provide them a sort of a class covering the curriculum they missed, missed and then enroll them into the mainstream education so that they can catch up. Girls Empowerment Program, they, on that one, the girls are um, trained about their rights, about their adolescent health and their reproductive rights and that sort of thing. And then we provide teacher training as well. And that will, improve, that will lead to the improved literacy and numeracy in adults and children, especially girls. And then we introduce the agriculture support, microfinance and skill training. And hope that leads to improved food security and more livelihood opportunities. So that is how it is. it becomes the empowered communities who demand service provision from the government. That is why we want to invest in health and that is why we, we feel this PPP in health is very important. So these are some of the fundamental things that we employ to work with the ourselves and with other organizations. What is the benefit of being an NGO? Uh, we can be flexible and this bureaucratic decision-making process we have so that we can, we can go to the needed, needy area quickly. Whereas for bigger organizations and uh, private organizations or government, it might take some time. Whereas for NGOs, we can do that uh, quickly. Uh, we have a, a saying in, uh, within our organization that NGOs are like a small boat, whereas the big organizations like this uh, uh, freight vessels, which can't go to the small rivers and tributaries, but uh, NGOs can go to the small rivers. That is, that is what we feel. That is where we feel the gap. And as I already mentioned that this is, uh, there are challenges of uh, being in NGO as well. For example, it is lack of continued funding. It is a biggest challenge and lack of trust from the government sometimes and, and duplicacy. Many organizations want to work in the EG area and that is another. And another big challenge still we have is North-South dichotomy because the, the organizations in the North I mean the bigger NGOs who fund the smaller NGOs in the developing countries, there is a still, they don't still treat equally. They, they just, oh, it is a giver and taker or something. So that, that is still a challenge. And there is a still a high staff turnover uh, in NGOs, especially, especially if you work in the difficult sector, especially remote areas, marginalized communities, that is still a challenge. So it is overall in the, what is the challenge PPP face? There are some, externally, there are some hidden interest uh, for the, all the parties, uh, government, uh, private sector and NGO sector. It is a political, it can be political interest, financial interest or business interest. And sometimes there are corruptions uh, even within, within NGOs and then all other sectors. And, and government's private, uh, government's priority versus this private sector and other sectors priority. Sometimes they might not match. And sometimes tight regulations and lengthy process and frequent change of government that hinders public-private partnership. And sometimes this government or the big organization try to impose interventions which are not government's priority. The especially international organizations, sometimes that happens and that has happened in the, uh, in the past. And the, another one is the geography. Not everybody wants to go to the very, very remote area. I'm talking in the very micro level. So, so that is also a challenge. And what in itself, PPE itself has sometimes has a challenge. Mostly it is urban focused and mostly profit oriented, especially if the private sector is involved and and there is sometimes lack of trust among the uh, partners and sometimes lack of awareness among the um, public or the beneficiaries makes like a complaints mismeasurement there has been some issues of the private hospitals being being vandalized 
and that's what in, in Nepal. And sometimes there's overpricing and medical volunteerism, unethical practices. And sometimes private sectors, it is difficult to regulate, especially if it is in the remote area. Some practice without license, some drug prescription you know, without the authority to prescribe. So these are some of the internal challenges. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to all three of our panelists and to the two that have joined live in the last few minutes of our webinar. We'll go to some questions. So first, um, in the order of speaking, Dr. Huntington, um, a couple of questions, actually. I have some from people that weren't able to join live. Um, the question you may have seen in Q&A is specific about the example you gave about New Zealand and why didn't the New Zealand program continue beyond 2018, any hurdle there? And more broadly, if you could think, um, tell us about the impact of um, new technologies and how that impacts measuring, impact, and completeness of contracts. Any thoughts on those issues? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, the New Zealand bond uh, finished in 2018. It was a three-year bond. Um, and usually in the health sector, the bonds are of short duration, three, five years at the most. So the bond finished, uh, investors were paid off, and the government absorbed the program into its regular budget. So the program continued uh, after a successful launch, I guess you could say, by the bond. Maybe that wasn't clear enough on my slide. Um, apologies for any confusion on that. Yeah, now on the second point on digital technologies, I mean, that's one thing that's really widely recognized by one of the positive impacts of the COVID pandemic on the health sector is the acceleration it's given to digital technologies and digital health uh, across, across the globe in many ways. Um, and certainly if we're thinking about use of digital technologies, the application of digital technologies to data collection and measuring outcomes uh, has been phenomenal and the field is changing rapidly, um, particularly as you're getting into patient reported outcomes measures of mobility, quality of life, activities of daily living. When you have digital technologies able to capture this type of information and relay it back to the healthcare provider is providing lots of new opportunities for measuring successful health benefits uh, of a diverse range of health conditions, reading from orthopedic surgeries, hip and knee replacements, being able to recover those daily livings. Um, to, to, well, uh, lots of applications. I won't go on beyond that. Uh, but I think that we're seeing um, the beginning uh, of how digital technologies are really changing our ability to define what's measurable and to provide data that's reliable and valid. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Karki, again, thank you for your contribution. And I know we didn't cover all of the rich material that you originally were going to talk about. So if you also want to respond about this issue of partnership and community resilience during the pandemic, how that has impacted your work and its interaction with technology, how that might change um, contractability of quality, lower cost, reaching the most vulnerable that might not have access to that um, technology. Any thoughts that you'd like to share? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for the question. I, I again, uh, want to emphasize that uh, the community presence of the community level presence of the NGOs or the staff that uh, made a huge that made uh, made a huge effect because uh, immediately uh, after the lock lockdown was introduced in. Uh, in Nepal in, from March 23rd, 2020, a national level lockdown. But the, what government did is that government requested or the directed all the health workers not to leave the, the airport. So uh, we had to pull out our staff, other, other working in other sector, 
but we managed to put uh, or we had to or at that time we managed to put uh, keep our staff in the post at the local level that uh, that helped them uh, to provide the regular service what we were uh, what we were planning um, uh, providing anyway uh, to, to the reduced level at the start because everyone was very much uh, uh, scared but later on people got used to and then at the, especially in very remote area when there was not much uh, spread of disease so that was one of the biggest learning from uh, both um, uh, this pandemic and in the, the past uh, uh, 2015 earthquake um, emergency in Nepal our experience shows that local level presence makes a huge thing huge uh, uh, impact or effect and to your second part of the question how the technology has helped you know especially in the area where we are working uh, it is sort of mobile phone access internets are still not that much uh, um, accessible uh, in, in many many part of Nepal uh, I mean high speed uh, internet not not possible but where there are um, technologies available then even the uh, consultation and then sort of telemedicine that type of thing that in that sort of uh, area uh, this technology will definitely help and the and that is uh, that is where this uh, public private partnership, the technology giants or the or the manufacturers can work together uh, with the local level organizations like us, uh, because they, it will be their technology, and then we will be the bridge between the community um, and the technology. So, so both the both the ways they can benefit. The community will benefit from the use of the technology, and then the private sector might benefit from the uh, one one thing philanthropist and then CSR sort of thing. And another thing, if there is money by selling the technology, because they have to also be you know, sustain, they have to also sustain to provide those service. So, is that did I make sense? Yes, thank you very much. So um, to both of you, actually, a question is, um, what do you think the lasting impacts of the pandemic moment might be? We've already touched upon that, and I know we don't all have crystal balls, but you have a lot of experience on the ground, and we've learned a lot about health systems, and we're also in a moment of, of rolling out of vaccines and trying to mitigate um, social and economic impacts from the pandemic and beyond. So I wonder your thoughts about what we're gonna learn, maybe looking back on this moment, five or more years from now, what do you think will be the lasting um, impacts on your area of work? What would you like to see happen? And what do you see the main challenges ahead? Thank you. Dale, over to you first. Okay, thank you. Well, that's a big question. Uh, and so I think I'll, I'll give a big answer uh, and then some aspiration. I think one of the lasting impacts is that clearly health is seen squarely as a driver of economic development. That question about is health a productive or non-productive sector is health to be valued as an investment by government over other economic sectors? That's been laid to the side. Uh, the impact of COVID and the health issues directly affecting economies around the world has squarely placed health as an economic investment. So I think that is something that will be lasting with us. Now, more aspirational, what I hope will be a lasting influence is the attention to equity and to the, 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 the disparities in access to health and health outcomes that the COVID pandemic has laid bare across societies around the world. So I would hope that one of the lasting impacts will be an attention to the, the equitable distribution of health benefits across the full range of the populations. Thank you. Dr. Karki, would you like to share some reflections on that question? 
Yeah, yeah, the same applies same. I I I totally agree with uh, Professor Huntington that what he, he said it is a big big <laughs> question, uh, especially for the organizations like us who are working at the grassroots level. Uh, it will it has again. I want to emphasize that it has a. It is. It is not only. It has a, impacted the grassroots level community, especially poorest the most. You know, the people. Uh, it is. It is an. Eventually, it is not only health. It has become the economic burden to them, uh, especially people from the developing country like Nepal, they who would sort of some sort of um, economy relies on remittance and other low skill level jobs, that sort of thing, the who can't be, which can't be completed by using the technology or that sort, they had to move. That was completely affected by this. So it actually, in case of Nepal, the this uh, pandemic, uh, not one was not only the health problem it was the biggest economic problem yeah, hard hit uh, for the bigger countries economic problem means also might mean for a billionaire he might have lost 10 percent 20 percent or 30 percent but he is still he or she still is a billionaire or the at least millionaire but in the country like nepal and then other south asian countries where people are struggling for their hand to mouth problem the health is not uh, not uh, one. This pandemic is not only the health problem. It is a real, real economic problem. It has pushed. Uh, I I don't have a figure, but it has pushed the majority of the population who were already in the below the poverty level further down. And then, uh, so that will be the that is the current effect. And in in terms of a uh, positive sense, it, it has taught people a lesson that, that they, they, should, they should invest in uh, healthcare or they should invest in, and it is not only the, you know, eventually it has helped by the technology or the um, or invention of the medicine, but uh, we forgot some sort of, for example, washing the hand. So, now it talked uh, everyone back that okay, it is very very important to wash your hand. So I hope that people will still practice that one even after the pandemic. So thank you, Karen. Thank you both so much. Do either of you have any parting uh, questions for each other or parting remarks before we close our webinar, uh, Dale? And then we'll give the last word to Dr. Karki. Yeah. No, thank you very much, Karen. I, I enjoyed the seminar very much. I enjoyed the other two presentations and the video leading into the seminar. Uh, and I look forward to listening in on some of your future symposiums. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karki. Yeah, no, I don't have any, any questions. Thank you very much for, for giving this opportunity. And it was really uh, amazing uh, listening to the, the the video you presented and then uh, Professor Huntington's uh, presentation, it was really good. And then the case from Cambodia. So thank you very much. Thank you both so much. And thank you everyone for joining. Stay well and join us for other webinars if you have time and interest. Thank you all very much.